1994, the democratic dispensation was ushered in on a glorious flood of ecstasy. Nelson Mandela oversaw a great wave of national unification and reconciliation, seizing two-thirds of the vote and dominating the political system as the leader of the tripartite alliance, a pact of shared government between the ANC, the Communist Party and COSATU, a consolidation of the labor unions. Even the old Nationalist Party saw most of its members join the ANC. The flag was a riot of colour and the national anthem became a medley of African nationalist hymns and the old national anthem. The new motto of the state was unity in diversity in an old queer language. The boundaries of the four old republics and the nine Bantustans were dissolved into nine new provinces. Roads were renamed and the day of the vow was transformed into the day of reconciliation. The new order became the embodiment of forgiveness and the promise of a coming Eden. The past would be forgiven but remembered so as never to be repeated. The nation would become one and all the people would see their basic needs met and join the white middle class around the swimming pool with German braai units and ice cold cocktails from Japanese fridges. We would be a moral beacon to the world and an example to history of how one could come from many and ethnic conflicts could be dissolved by tolerance and social liberalism. Very few feel this way now, but it was what most all South Africans felt then, that anything was possible. For years, the share of the vote for the ruling party increased, and the opportunities for public services, employment and entrepreneurship opened up in the major cities. Migrant labor gave way to more permanent urbanization, and the economy grew vigorously for a decade as the black middle class grew and malnutrition disappeared, gradually replaced by obesity. People learned to interact with government departments and a general spirit of reconciliation emerged as the quality of life for most black people began improving. But poverty and stark inequality still persists. And while that would be part of the ordinary nature of things for any other developing nation, in South Africa's current dispensation it is deeply destabilizing. This is because the rule of the ANC is based on a promise, and one that is inherently unachievable because it is utopian. It also stokes racial tensions, since inequality, for historical reasons, is largely expressed along racial lines. Less than 2% of white people live in extreme poverty, however that figure amongst black people is more than 20%. To maintain power, the state has resorted to scapegoating, corruption and soft repression. The party of liberation has finally burnt out all our love. To understand their outlook, it would not be enough to simply observe the handover of the reins of power. One must journey into the distant past. The ANC is the oldest African liberation movement, and one of the oldest political parties in the world, only two years younger than the country itself. It was founded in 1912 by a coalition of petty royalty and intellectual elite who sought an equal place at the table of the Union. At that time, most blacks lived in a tribal homeland consisting of 13% of the national land area. They were facing a Malthusian crisis as population growth began to outpace the availability of agricultural land, making them extremely vulnerable. South African politics is informed by the nature of traditional governance. Before modern population densities, when only a million people lived in South Africa, a territory three times the size of Germany, land was held in common and apportioned by chiefs. There was enough space to relocate freely, so public choice politics reigned. A lord's power was reliant on popularity and the ability to resolve disputes. A divisive leader would cause the people to scatter and set up under other chiefs, which meant that consensus building was not only practical, but deeply culturally inscribed. This traditional view of community as consensus-based and collaborative, as well as populist and distributive, is known as Ubuntu. But Ubuntu has its dark side as well. Those considered outside the community are often referred to with grammatical noun categories normally used to describe animals and inanimate objects. Consequently, and much like colonial society itself, black politics has been defined by who is considered inside or outside the community. Cultural etiquette of deference to leadership and seniority is balanced with a right to be consulted about decisions. But as population density rose, free roam was replaced by raiding and military consolidation under powerful emperors like Shaka and Zilikazi, 
who demanded total submission and accepted no limits to their right to employ violence to unite people under their name or extract taxation and women. The principle of consultation was eroded as the size of the community expanded. As these kingdoms were beaten and hemmed in by expanding white colonies, pressure to maintain internal unity became an existential political concern. In the 1940s, the ANC was split roughly three ways. Between the Old Guard, who believed in peaceful means of petition, the African nationalists, who believed in more pragmatic and flexible tactics towards achieving dominance, and the communists, who preferred a more totalizing and uncompromising program. But unity became the overarching theme. They agreed to boycott the native council elections in 1948 and hoped that the radicalism of the National Party would put white voters off Grand Apartheid. But this did not come to pass. Instead, blacks became entirely shut out of all political processes and ignored. The party was in direct alliance with the Communist Party for most of the post-war period. But disagreements led Oliver Tambo to attempt to eject them. In 1955, the ANC convened the Congress of the People, a broad coalition of different anti-apartheid interest groups, and created a mandate for radical political and economic transformation called the Freedom Charter. It is here that the future aims of the party were decided, and the African nationalists settled their differences with communism. Forming a pact with the unions, the Communist Party, the Indian and Colored Congress parties, and the Federation of South African Women, this ensured that feminism, socialism, and racial equality would be cornerstones of the movement going forward. The Charter promised the abolition of racial discrimination, the banning of offensive speech, broad welfare, a 40-hour work week, universal free housing, education, and medical treatment, the right to settle on any land without permission, and the nationalization of all major industries, land, and resources. It also provided the right to be taught in one's native language. But these ideals would soon warp under the heat of armed struggle. During the 1950s, tensions formed within the party. Radical Africanists objected to sharing political organizations with coloreds, whites and Indians, and were impatient about the slow pace of change. The Pan-Africanist Congress broke away to form a black-only organization under Robert Subukwe, who nevertheless embodied non-racialist rhetoric in public speeches. They initiated a nationwide resistance campaign. Their plan to burn the mandatory identity passes and hand themselves into police stations en masse ended in bloodshed at Sharpville. Mass protests erupted and all African liberation movements were banned. After this triggering event, the ANC left into gear launching its own armed wing, Umkuntu Sizwe, or MK, receiving support from other African liberation movements across the continent, as did the PAC, creating Poko, also known as APLA, the Azanian People's Liberation Army, referring to South Africa as Azania, and gave us the slogan, One Settler, One Bullet. When 3,000 of their members were arrested in PAL in 1962, the PAC essentially disappeared. Umkuntu Sizwe, under the direction of Nelson Mandela, took an official strategic position of engaging only in sabotage and targeting no living people. But he had to make it clear that the aims of the ANC were to be achieved by any means necessary and that no strategy was to be ruled out if less radical measures had failed to produce results. After the leadership of the ANC and Mkuntu Esizwe were arrested at Rivonia in 1963 and imprisoned on Robben Island, the party virtually disappeared in South Africa for 15 years, scattered into exile. The 60s and 70s were mostly quiet. Oliver Tambo, taking a pragmatic stance on the communists, approached the Soviet Union for support in late 1963. Moscow trained a small detachment of soldiers who, led by Chris Harney, attempted to launch a guerrilla campaign from Zimbabwe in 1967, but were repulsed, and the party made them hand themselves in at Botswana to avoid the fallout from the South African Special Branch Intelligence Services which included broad intelligence investigations and torture, including the pioneering of the technique later known as waterboarding. After being released, Hani wrote a memo criticizing the party for living in luxury in exile, while others laid their lives on the line. They expelled him from the party and dug a special underground cell for him and other signatories of this memo to be tortured in, and only due to the direct intervention of Oliver Tambo was he spared. This led to the 1969 Morogoro Conference in Tanzania, this saw a centralization of the movement in a combined political-military executive. 
and a restriction of membership to blacks only, citing the uniqueness of black victimhood and the absolute inherent untrustworthiness of the oppressor caste. Indians and coloureds were allies, but not full members. In this relative peace, the bulk of the liberation movement was taken up by the Anglican church-based Black Consciousness Movement, which took influence from the more radical PAC, under the slogan, Black Man, You Are On Your Own. Between Black Consciousness and the later formed Inkata Freedom Party, they dominated the struggle against apartheid until the very end of the 1970s, reaching hundreds of thousands of official members. Young black consciousness leaders like Steve Biko and Sietzi Mashinini, influenced by radical black nationalists like Franz Fanon and Robert Zabukwe, organized a nationwide student protest against the mandatory use of Afrikaans as a medium of instruction in 1976. Biko believed in segregation within political organization to prevent white entryism, and considered white liberals inherently untrustworthy because of systemic privileges. Their campaign was put down in a hail of machine gun fire, and a year later, Biko was arrested and beaten to death in his cell, officially claimed to have died slipping in the shower. In all, the apartheid state would murder 73 people in police custody after 1963. These events attracted international outrage, economic sanctions, and mobilized global support for the anti-apartheid resistance. Seeing that the struggle wasn't quite over, the Soviet Union agreed to support the ANC's armed struggle to the tune of millions of dollars in today's money, as well as military training and academic scholarships. Leaders were sent to Vietnam to learn about the strategy which Vo Nguyen Siap had used to defeat the United States. Called a People's War, it was a never-ending use of covert terror, propaganda and guerrilla strikes, where every man, woman and child was pressed into service by the movement and neutrality or collaboration was punished with death or torture, as was suspected spying, allowing cadres to melt into the population. Formally adopting this in their Green Book on Tactics in 1979, a year into operations, the ANC set about destroying and consuming all rival struggle movements, beating, humiliating, torturing, even burning alive any of those they found buying products from white-owned businesses, reading rivals' literature, or merely to have a rumor spread about them. Rumors thus became a lethal means of settling personal feuds. Winnie Mandela, the wife of Nelson Mandela, after being radicalized with personal experiences of police violence, became famous for her uncompromising use of necklacing on suspected spies, even children. She told the people that democracy and communism were identical and that one could not be had without the other, and therefore that the official ideology would have to be adhered to. Much of this totalitarianism and territorial control was supplemented by smuggling and drug dealing, and several members like Jomo Dice became adept and wealthy criminals, a class from which many members were recruited in this period. In exile, political refugees were forced to seek shelter under the ANC, who had infiltrated the UN High Commission of Refugees. Exiles were forced to toe the party line or face death or re-education in special political prisons. While the known death toll stands at over 20,000, the precipitous incline in homicides from 1978 until 1994 paints a bigger picture. The ANC blamed all of this on a so-called third force and accused them of the tactics that they themselves were using. Most of this was swallowed by the media, who ignored or actively lied about ANC crimes. White liberal journalists, both international and local, adopted a policy of de-emphasizing ANC crimes, something they called the 20 to 2 rule. For every two sentences spent describing ANC violence, 20 must be spent on apartheid government violence. As Tami Mazwai reported in 1990, little has been said about a new type of censorship that is around in the townships and poses the most powerful threat to press freedom in this country. Journalists are far less exposed to arrest, detention and incarceration by the government than they used to be but are threatened and mishandled by political activists in the townships, in the towns and everywhere, and are being told to toe the line or else. You must make your stories convey a particular meaning. In other words, you must be a propagandist. If there were 20 people at a meeting, and it is not in the interest of the organization for the public to be told that there were only 20 people present, you have got to add a couple of noughts, and if you don't add those noughts, then you become an enemy of the struggle. The weapon that is used is to whisper, to spread the word around that so-and-so is against the struggle. 
and heaven help you if you are ever cornered by youngsters, they will make you pay. As the international sanctions began crippling the apartheid economy, strikes galvanized opposition. A new constitution was drawn up, drastically expanding the capacity of security forces and giving partial representation to coloreds and Indians. Colored Dutch reform pastor Alan Busak responded by uniting unions, churches, minority representatives, civil rights organizations and student groups under the United Democratic Front, which soon became the public face of the banned ANC. The UDF combined their peaceful protest with the ANC's labor strikes, bombs, public executions, torture and sabotage in a grand Mott and Bailey strategy, and church pulpits became dominated by politicking. Desmond Tutu, the Anglican Archbishop of Cape Town, became one of the most powerful leaders for peaceful resistance, mobilizing up to 300,000 people at a time. As the negotiations to end apartheid began in 1990, leaders kept up the pressure of protest, violent and peaceful, while agreements were being drafted on paper. The IFP, afraid of what the ANC might do once they got into power, aggressively lobbied for Zulu independence. Even going so far, as to engage in training programs with dissident members of the security forces of the apartheid state, who were aligned with the Afrikaner Weerstandsbeweging, the Nationalist Party and the Conservative Party. They engaged in much of the same tactics as the ANC had. The notion of a third force had become a self-fulfilling prophecy. During an otherwise peaceful Zulu nationalist protest in 1994, where the IFP appeal for Zulu independence, Mandela phoned into ANC headquarters at Shell House and ordered security to fire into the crowd, killing up to 50 people. The IFP were seen as collaborators. But after Shell House, Mandela told Butelezi that it was no use, Zululand would be integrated, and offered him a cabinet position in compensation. During this time, horrified by the tactics that his wife had used during the armed struggle, and unwilling to share her uncompromising style of politics, Mandela pursued a divorce against Winnie. Meanwhile, they had de-mobbed Mkuntu Esizwe, to the chagrin of Chris Hani, a fanatic and principled communist who called for the reignition of armed struggle during meetings of the multi-party negotiation process. He was assassinated by far-right Polish immigrant Janusz Walusz and Conservative Party MP Clive Darby Lewis. Despite rumours about an inside job, Darby Lewis, dying of cancer on prison release in 2016, told Ernst Roots that his motivation was to stop the ascension of a tyrant that the ANC could not control. He hoped that the chaos would have postponed negotiations and allowed the Conservative Party to win an all-white election and preserve apartheid. But the chaos of the moment was no match for Mandela's negotiation skills. Drawing on his cultural heritage in traditional consensus-based politics and his experience in finding compromise between disparate voices in the ANC, Mandela managed to forge a consensus out of white, black and Zulu nationalism, communists, conservatives and liberals. An election date was set for April 27, 1994, and a government of national unity was agreed upon. And with the vast majority of the voting public being black, the ANC's victory was guaranteed. Unlike the radical elements in his party, Mandela saw South Africa as a unified, non-racialist society and under his leadership, this vision would make all the difference. In the next episode, we will be exploring the era of the democratic dispensation and the ANC in government. The ANC has promised that there will be housing, mm. there will be schooling, there will be education, there will be that and that and that. Will you give them one year, two years, three years, four years? After the 27th, I would give them two months.